The World Health Organization says COVID-19 appears to be accelerating with cases soaring in the United States, the United Kingdom, and India. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, and this is The Heat. With now more than 31 million cases globally and nearly 1 million deaths, health experts say there's growing concern the coronavirus pandemic could get even worse in the coming months. India now has over 5.6 million cases with 90,000 deaths, and it could surpass the United States for the most number of cases. We'll hear from a journalist and a doctor about the situation in New Delhi just a little bit later on in the show. But first, the United States hit a grim milestone this week, reaching 200,000 deaths, and a top health official says 90 percent of the U.S. population is still at risk of getting sick. Europe is now experiencing a second wave of infections. On Tuesday, the British government announcing new restrictions, including working from home. So let's get straight to our panel. Joining us from the United Kingdom via Skype is Chris Smith. He's a clinical lecturer in virology at the University of Cambridge. Joseph Williams is the senior news editor with U.S. News and World Report right here in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and from Scottsdale, Arizona, Will Humble is the executive director of the Arizona Public Health Association. And we'll start with you, Will. Uh, a startling statement, really, from uh, Robert Redfield, the head of the CDC, before a Senate panel today. He says uh, the majority of Americans still very much at risk of this virus. Let's listen to what he had to say. CDC is currently performing large-scale serology testing across the United States. Preliminary results uh, appear to show that most Americans have not been infected with the virus and are still vulnerable to the infection, serious illness, and death. A majority of our nation, um, more than 90 percent of the population, remains susceptible. More than 90 percent. Uh, it's hard to imagine we've got 200,000 deaths here in this country and still so many people at risk of this virus. What do you take away from this message? Yeah, well, that serology study that Dr. Redfield mentioned is happening right here in Arizona right now. And actually, that's similar results that we're seeing here. Uh, you know, a lot of people are susceptible. You know, uh, one of the things that is happening, at least right here in Arizona, is that um, because some of the intervention measures that have been in place, face covering requirements, uh, uh, they pause the the, the bars and nightclubs for some time. We've got the case numbers down to a manageable level so that the case investigations and contact tracing can actually be effective. Now, that's, I'm talking about what's happening here in Arizona. And, you know, but it's different in every state. And that's the thing about the United States response is that the governors have so much authority and drive so much of this policy. And that's why we're seeing such big differences. Um, in the United States right now, depending on what you, state you're in. As I mentioned, Arizona has leveled off right now, but there are many states, especially in the middle of the country, where the virus is really on the uptick. And what would have happened if there was a coordinated national response? Well, I think if there had been a more coordinated response, we'd be in much better shape. You know, a part of this has to do with the nature of our republic. The governors in each of our states have a lot of authority. Um, and there hasn't been the kind of uh, leadership at the national level to step in and drive that policy uh, through the governors. It's really been a decentralized process, and that's why we have this patchwork of effectiveness. Some states have really been doing a terrific job and really haven't been hit that hard. Other states uh, have taken more of a laissez-faire approach, and those are the states right now where you see a big uptick in cases. Examples are uh, places like Iowa. And, and Chris, let's talk about the U.K. because uh, Boris Johnson said this week that uh, the country is uh, in a perilous turning point when it comes to the virus. Um, he's urging people, the citizens, to help blunt the spread of the virus. Let's listen to what he had to say. Never in our history has... Well, apparently we lost the tape, but he, but he did say that, uh, you know... <laughs> He's, he's, closing, uh, he's closing restaurants and bars at 10 p.m., which I'm sure is not going to go over all that well. But he talked about, uh, you know, this spirit of natural, national sacrifice. He said there's been too many breaches allowing the invisible enemy to slip through undetected. Um, this concept of national shared sacrifice, uh, is that message going to go over? Is it going to resonate? Uh, this is a very tricky situation. And 
similarly to the figures cited by the serology studies done in America, we think that between 90 and 95 percent of people in the UK, this is based on antibody tests, have not had coronavirus. So when you remind people that actually 95 percent of the population could still catch it, and when you see these graphs which show very alarming increase in cases based on projections, these are not predictions, they're projections, a, a what-if scenario, the aim I think is to focus minds and to remind people that the virus hasn't gone away. We've spent about a third of a trillion pounds on a lockdown so far to buy us time, but all that's done is to kick the can down the road and give us an opportunity to prepare a bit better for the forthcoming winter. And I think it's with that winter in mind that they're acting, because we know that all viruses spread much better in wintertime than they do in summertime. And so we're going to be fighting on multiple fronts. We've got a population susceptible to coronavirus. We've got levels that are rising because of prior easing of lockdown measures and a degree of complacency in the population. And all of that coupled with trying to fight on multiple fronts against the usual seasonal suspects rearing their ugly heads in the form of the usual common cold type viruses, many symptoms of which overlap with coronavirus and therefore apply pressure to testing systems. So it's a tough one. And I think that's why they're trying to focus minds. But not everyone is, is enthusiastic to embrace the idea. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, let's talk about messaging here in the United States, because it's in stark contrast to Boris Johnson talking about shared sacrifice. Uh, President Trump has been downplaying the virus. He's been very vocal about that. Bob Woodward, of course, talking about that in his book. But uh, he did it again in Dayton, Ohio, uh, where he once again played down the risks of the virus, especially for young people. Let's listen to what he had to say. In some states, thousands of people, nobody young, below the age of 18, like nobody. They have a strong immune system. Who knows? You look and you take your hat off to the young because they have a hell of an immune system. But it affects virtually nobody. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. By the way, open your schools. Everybody open your schools. It affects virtually nobody. Talking about young people, uh, it's worth noting Dr. Anthony Fauci dismissing that argument. He, he says it could be very serious for young people. Give me a read on his comments. The problem here is that uh, you've got a tension between the politics of, uh, of the United States and how we run our presidential elections and a president who wants everyone to carry on as though nothing is amiss and scientists who have been ringing the alarm bell for months about this virus and 200,000 people dead. Uh, to say that it does not afflict the young would be news to at least 10 percent of that 200,000 where you've got about that many who have suffered from the virus and who have died. So the problem is that you've got a lack of leadership at the top because it's not in the president's best interests to, uh, to lead on this issue, mostly because he's filled with erroneous information. On the one hand, if he had managed the crisis correctly, we probably wouldn't even be having this discussion uh, about whether or not politics are influencing our response to the virus. But on the other hand, because he has not, uh, his best play now, politically at least, is to pretend that things are normal and that this is not a big deal and hold open air rallies with hundreds of people packed together and not worry about, uh, about mask regulations and even have, uh, trying to quell discord within his own coronavirus research team, which is happening right now. Uh, Dr. Fauci, as you noted, uh, testified against the president in suggesting that this is a big deal and that young people do catch the virus and that schools are better served without opening. And Deborah Burks is looking at leaving the coronavirus tax force because she believes that there have been political interference in the response. And we haven't even begun to talk about what's going on at the CDC, where there's been a lot of political influence. And all of this has led to a muddled mixed message. And that's been a huge problem for the populist. And the president thinks that this is something that's going to get him passed through to the election. And it's not a certainty that it will. And, Will, what about that muddled message? Because you're in Arizona. It's a state with uh, one of the highest rates of COVID-19 in young people. And, and clearly, uh, some people are listening to this and thinking it's not a big deal. Young people still going about their business. And it is spreading. Well, that's for sure. Uh, the big spread right now in Arizona is around those zip codes that surround our big universities. 
Uh, now, the universities themselves have good mitigation plans, lots of robust testing, and when students turn positive, they've got places to do isolation and quarantine. Uh, the issues are really around those universities, those off-campus apartment complexes, and you can see the weekend behavior is just pre-pandemic. And if they don't get a handle on that off-campus partying and don't change the attitude of those young people, it's going to amplify the virus. And what ends up happening is it leaks into these um, care homes and senior centers and places where more elderly people are living. And that is where the virus can be quite lethal. And so that has really been a challenge across the whole country, and in particular in Arizona, is to get younger people and other demographics. There are, it's a political element here as well. I have to be honest about that. There are people who strongly support the president who, because of the rhetoric that he uses, has adopted the attitude that this is not a dangerous virus. And as a result, their behavior is much like what we see with the university students. Yeah, and Joseph, let's talk a little bit more about that because you kind of alluded to it. Earlier this week, uh, Trump was at a rally in Ohio and the lieutenant governor went on stage and, and pretty much urged everybody to put on a mask, even showed off Trump masks. Uh, he was booed by the people in attendance. Uh, they don't like to wear masks. They aren't wearing masks. And yet, getting back to Boris Johnson in his speech this week, he said he understands why people don't want to wear masks, but he said, your mild cough can be somebody's death knell. Um, again, getting back to this messaging, why have masks become so political? Um, in part because the president has made them so. I mean, certainly when the pandemic started reaching full force, he was urged to wear a mask and was very ambivalent at best in wearing one. Occasionally he would put one on, but now he's decided that he's going to go full without a mask, and his followers are very devoted to that. Um, people believe that that this is a government uh, conspiracy, that, that wearing a mask somehow makes you submissive and that we are the land of the free. And uh, I think one of your comments, uh, your commentators alluded to it earlier, I believe it was the doctor, talked about we are 50 states with 50 different responses, more or less, and if we had one singular response, we probably would be in much better shape. Now, unfortunately, that's not a, a philosophy for the governing party. The governing party believes very strongly in decentralization. They believe in, in states' rights. And that's part of the issue is that the virus does not respect state borders. The virus is everywhere. The virus transmits from one place to the other. And a cruel irony of this whole thing is that a lot of the new hotspots are in red states, uh, Iowa, uh, Nebraska, uh, Missouri, South Carolina. You, the list would go on. And, and so President Trump has even alluded to the fact that if you eliminated the, red, the blue states that we've been in much better, better shape, that's simply not true. And Chris, uh, in the UK, people shun masks. I know there was a poll out in July. I, I think it said 38% of the people in the UK were wearing masks, whereas in Spain it was 88%. Has that attitude changed at all there, or is this still a hurdle that has to be overcome in the UK as well? Well, I think people are taking a sensible approach. The guidance is that you should wear and resort to wearing some kind of face covering where you can't do physical distancing. And this is because physical distance is your best defense. Viruses don't have tape measures, they don't have stopwatches, they don't know how far and how long you've been standing near or away from somebody. But if you can't put yourself at a distance that puts you beyond the reach of the droplets that spread the virus, then one way to protect those people that you're going to be close to is to cover your face it can produce a small benefit. This is not some amazing panacea. It produces a small additional benefit, which, if you can't do social distancing, can help. So if you're walking down a street and you're outside, your risk is actually very, very low outside, so there's not really much benefit in wandering down the street if you're on your own wearing a face covering. But if you're on public transport, you're in an enclosed area, you're in an area where lots of other people are passing through, you can do them a service by covering your face because you're reducing your deposition of droplets from your airway that might carry virus with them and therefore other people are not going to breathe that in. I think people kind of get that message, but it is, it is frustrating. I mean, I work for the National Health Service and the rule was imposed there two or three months ago. And so we are going through every single day having to spend an entire day behind some kind of face covering in offices everywhere. It's very uncomfortable, it's very unpleasant, it's very difficult to actually communicate properly with colleagues and patients. And I think people who work in retail and other sorts of environments are finding the same thing. So there is naturally a sort of pushback against this, but most people are being sensible. Where it can help, they're trying to do their best.
Will, there is uh, mass fatigue. I think there's fatigue in general about the virus uh, in Arizona and Scottsdale, where you are. I know the mayor this week uh, basically uh, rescinded the mass mandate. Um, and my question to you is, can we get a handle on this virus if we keep gyrating back and forth? I mean, open the economy, kind of shut it back down, masks, yes, no to masks. Uh, this back and forth, uh, the, the consistent messaging just isn't there. That's correct. And uh, to me, I see two key interventions that we need to continue to implement until we get widespread application of the vaccine. Number one is to get a face covering requirement and have good compliance with most people in indoor public environments. And for that, we need, at least in Arizona and in most of the United States, voluntary isn't working. You've got to have a mask mandate so that you can compel that behavior. That's the first thing. The second thing is, as we've talked about, these indoor environments like bars and nightclubs. And you mentioned what uh, the prime minister did in the UK with respect to the bars there or the pubs there. Uh, you've got to get better mitigation measures in these bars and nightclubs because that is the environment where this virus spreads so quickly. And so in Arizona, the key is really face covering requirements, better mitigation in restaurants, bars and nightclubs. So far, we're doing OK. But as you mentioned, the mayor just dropped uh, the mask mandate here in Scottsdale. Fortunately, our county government is continuing to have that mask mandate. So that's a wider jurisdiction. So it didn't, in effect, change anything. Um, but it shows you that there is now an erosion. As you mentioned, the fatigue, there's an erosion with some of these elected officials um, in their commitment to the face covering requirement. And to me, it's so puzzling because the face covering is the highest return on investment intervention that we have. It costs virtually nothing. And yet, it, yeah, it, but these lockdowns cost a fortune. And so if you want to prevent another lockdown, if you want to prevent bars and nightclubs closing again or restaurants or other public entities, uh, businesses, you've got to keep the face covering in place. And it's practically free. That's what's so frustrating about this is to hear people uh, that, that push back against an intervention that's essentially free that we now know works very well. Yeah, Joseph, uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration reportedly considering new rules on the authorization on a COVID-19 vaccine. That would probably push it back beyond uh, the November election date that uh, Trump keeps assuring everyone it's going to be available. Give me your sense. Where are we on, on the vaccines? Well, uh, I think uh, that that's pretty uh, logical, and I think that's pretty appropriate. I mean, Johnson & Johnson is in stage three trials for its vaccine. They're one of only a handful of companies that have made it that far, despite this uh, Operation Warp Speed program, where we've been throwing money uh, at these drug companies trying to get them to, to make a virus. Uh, President Trump says, yes, a virus will be available by the end of the year. That's probably highly unlikely. And even if the virus does miraculously happen, it's going to be very limited in scope. It probably won't be nearly as effective as if we had had more time to develop the virus. It probably will, you know, if, if it's effective at 50%, yeah. that would be considered a success. Yeah. So it's highly likely there was going to be the middle of next year. I wouldn't expect it any sooner. All right, Joseph, thanks so much. I want to thank all our panelists. We now turn to India. The South Asian country is the second highest in the world for COVID-19 infections, despite a massive lockdown in March. Earlier, I spoke with independent journalists Neha Dixit and Dr. Panjan uh, Solanki about the situation in New Delhi. See, what is happening? We have increased the testing rate, and India is a very densely populated country. Uh, we are doing a test of around 1.2 million per day. And uh, the number is bound to increase in the coming days. Uh, I want to surprise the number comes to 150,000 per, per day. Because uh, people have to now move out of their home for the livings and for other, for, for the livings, for the goods and for other things. Practically, there is no lockdown as such as of now. Only the school and the college and the universities, they are closed. That's how things are functioning as, as it was earlier. Neha, let me ask you about these uh, infections soaring and yet India opening up. Describe for us what we're seeing there. Right now, the infections are soaring. Yes, definitely. Today is the first day where we saw a very high-profile death. Um, the Minister of uh, State for Railways in India, Suresh Angadi, passed away today because of COVID-19. In the past few, uh, few days, we've seen several heads of states 
in, in the Indian states uh, being infected with COVID. Even the Delhi Deputy Chief Minister is, that is now uh, in, in the hospital because of COVID-19. Home Minister Ramit Shah has been diagnosed with COVID and now still in the hospital, not able to uh, attend the parliament session. This is so even though the markets are opening, even though mobility has increased, the cases are rising. And the worst part is that even though there are testing centers, we are noticing that in, in, in rural parts of several of India, the doctors and the health professionals, like we just got to know that there is a uh, scarcity of the health professionals, but at the same time, because the states are, are in so much of a rush to open the markets, what they're doing is that they're going to urban slums or they're going to rural areas and catching hold of the socioeconomically marginalized people and just randomly taking them to the testing centers to fill some kind of quota that this number of testing is done. Because earlier India was criticized for not doing enough uh, testing of patients. And which is why I would say that right now the conditions are really worse because the most affected people are uh, particularly in uh, urban poor settlements because of insanitary conditions, unhygienic conditions, and not being able to maintain any kind of social distancing because they live in cramped, they live in cramped places. The other uh, section that is also very affected because of COVID is, uh, for instance, TB patients. So a lot of tuberculosis patients could not access healthcare because of the uh, lockdown in COVID. And now many of them are scared. And because right now also, apart from uh, the lockdown and the spread of the disease, there is massive unemployment and there's massive uh, lack of even food for people to survive on. So which is why patients who already have diseases like TB are further uh, facing malnutrition because of lack of food. So that, that is a large number. India has a large population of such patients. So that is something that really needs to be paid attention to. Apart from that, one thing that I really wanted to say was that many things we are still not getting to know because even the Indian government just before the lockdown and even the Supreme Court later requested media to only uh, put out positive stories and official claims. So which is why it's uh, anybody who's critical of uh, the government in particularly uh, the treatment, the tackling of COVID cases is being charged. So 55 journalists have been actually facing uh, either criminal cases or some kind of punishment in the last three months because of their reporting around COVID. So which is why we are also not even able to get a clear picture from various dis distant parts of the country. Wow, sounds like a uh, perfect storm there. Uh Neha, let me, let me ask a follow-up on this. Uh, the, the strict lockdown uh, happened in March. 1.3 billion people, Narendra Modi saying, stay at home. It extended till May. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, it, I, I think it was a, an economist, chief economist, former chief economist of the World Bank, who said uh, it failed because it did exactly what a lockdown should not do, basically sending people into the countryside, spreading the virus, and as you said, many of these people in cramped locales. So what has this done to the economy? Are there any signs of life? Uh, like you just said, firstly, this lockdown was completely unplanned, So, which is why it was announced at 8 p.m. on 22nd March, and by, by 12 o'clock midnight, it was supposed to be imposed. So there was no planning. People couldn't plan, couldn't buy stuff. And now the condition is that uh, almost uh, our GDP has fallen, it's, it's minus, uh, uh, it's, it's in negative now. Unemployment is the uh, rate is the highest in the last 45 years. And uh, 2,100,000 ,000 salaried jobs have been, uh, are lost. So people, there is absolutely mayhem everywhere. There is lack of livelihood, there is retrenchment. And across industries, whether it's media or whether it's other places, uh, it's completely affected. India has a very a big unorganized sector, which is 93% of, of the workforce is in the unorganized sector. And it is uh, very brutally affected because of this unplanned lockdown. So we are definitely seeing starvation deaths already in states like Chhattisgarh, in, in Jharkhand, in some parts of Uttar Pradesh and North India. So starvation deaths have already started rising. So we don't know where we are going from here. And Dr. the so only kind of schemes that the government has come up with is, is providing loans and not actually any, any kind of immediate relief. In fact, it's worth noting that even the relief material, uh, basic food supplies during the lockdown, 70% of it was provided by civil society and uh, other other uh, associations and not the government. So that's something that something really needs to be taken into uh, account. 
Uh, Dr. Solanke, uh, it, according to the BBC, uh, more than 50 million people have been tested in India, and yet still the testing rate very low. I mean, there's a lot of people in that country. What needs to be done in terms of testing? See, what needs to be done uh, is a very difficult question, question because since India is, I, I already stated that India is a very populous country. We are, we are 1.3 billion plus. And uh, what is happening, the government is doing its bit, but it's not enough actually. The government has to look, look out to other measures as well. Because when the uh, number of COVID positive patients were around 5,000, 6,000 a day, the staff was still the same. And when it is like around 100,000 a day, the, st the staff and the healthcare workers are still the same. We cannot produce them overnight. We'll have to look for other measures as well. Now, one thing, the, uh, one of the, most of the government in the state follow, follow, followed up Delhi, and they started home isolation. But you need to see that the, with the people living in the space in the homes, like they, they may be a, like, uh, let's say for 500 square feet area and people living in there are maybe five to six. And if there's one COVID patient in there, so you expect others to be COVID positive as well. So the number is bound to rise over the time. Number is bound to rise. But what needs to be done is still a very difficult question. The government has to find measures. The government will have to do something. And we, we will not be too able to do anything unless we get a vaccine or some other measures. Uh, Neha, one final question before we go. I've, I've got to ask you about education. Some of the schools reopening. Uh, how's online learning gone? I know that some of the rural areas, it's been very difficult for students. Give us the, the lowdown on what we're seeing there. So uh, just two days back, the Indian, uh, the Delhi High Court gave uh, an order saying that uh, we have to end the digital appetite that is happening right now in this country because there is huge disparity. And while in some urban middle class, urban rich centers, students are able to access internet, but across sections, almost 90% of the students in various parts are unable to uh, uh, do this kind of remote learning. This includes both higher education students in higher education and both at schools. We've seen suicides by students for not being able to do online classes. We've also seen uh, parents uh, 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 low income uh, parents from low income backgrounds selling their only cattle that they have, only cow that they have to be able to buy a smartphone for the child to uh, take classes. So uh, I agree with the high court. It's a it's a very uh, uh, poignant term, which is digital appetite, which is uh, systemically uh, uh, excluding students who are disadvantaged and who are marginalized. And uh, it kind of uh, deepens because all the competitive exams right now, for example, the, the national level engineering exam uh, or, or the basic other teaching exams are being held online. And that completely puts uh, people from the remote corners at a disadvantage situation. So the, things are very bad and people are struggling and there is no, no hope anywhere right now. Well, I want to thank both of you for uh, giving us uh, the uh, layout of the difficult terrain there in India. Certainly appreciate it. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.